just a, a couple housekeeping rules. Um, does everybody have a copy of the Purple Book? We have many copies of the Purple Book. So uh, we can uh, bounce out a few. Uh, there's also uh, a holy card with Father Walter Chisholm on it if you'd like. Last week we did Father, Father Stanley Rother. Uh, there's a card if you'd like for him. Uh, in our booklet tonight, at the end of our presentation, um, Father Walter begins on page three, but we're going to go over to uh, page four, and we're going to do, uh, actually it begins on the bottom of page three, uh, something from his uh, a novena that, that we can pray, that we've been praying uh, on the superior conversion, which Father Rich will talk about in great detail. Uh, we'll do the prayer for surrender, and then we we'll go back to page three, the, the cause for canonization for Father Walter. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for coming tonight, and uh, I see some of my Jesuit brothers here, which is kind of nice to see. Uh, been a while since I've seen them, um, so that's very nice. Thank you for coming. Um, just a, a couple other commercials. Um, Father Jonathan Kalish, who is a Dominican friar, who is the Supreme Chaplain for the Knights of Columbus and Director of all their spiritual activities, was supposed to be here talk about the cause of canonization for Father Michael McGivney, and also on uh, his scholarship of uh, St. Pope John Paul II. However, uh, I was informed this week, uh, Father Jonathan called me, and because of the humanitarian crisis in uh, Ukraine, Father Jonathan was getting ready to leave for Poland, where it's part of the Knights of Columbus's effort uh, to make sure that the humanitarian relief that the Knights were providing would get to the refugees uh, back out of clean um, Ukraine right now because of Russian aggression. Um, God doesn't close a door where he doesn't open a window, and uh, therefore a while I think we might have to cancel. But what we're going to do, and there will be hopefully details in your bulletin. If not, please call here and we can give them to you. Um, Monday night, March 21st, we'll have a concelebrated mass of all the priests in the school of deanery. Uh, Father Philip Rogers, who is a past state chaplain of the Knights of Columbus, will be our celebrant. And Father Jim Carroll, who is a Byzantine Franciscan friar, uh, will be our homeless. Uh, Father Carroll, as many of you know, he's the administrator of St. Mary's Byzantine Catholic Church over in Monte City, and he has family in Ukraine. So he'll talk a little bit about that. Tuesday night, uh, our Knights of Columbus Council, 14009, St. John Neumann Regional Council, will lead us in uh, Stations of the Cross, which were written by Pope John Paul II. Uh, just a caution, we have the booklets for you, but Pope John Paul, in his wisdom, just like he gave us theology of the body, the luminous mysteries of the rosary, and a few other things, introduced us to Mother uh, Faustina, uh, his stations of the cross are slightly different. So uh, just be prepared. There's like three or four stations that, that are different, so I don't want you to think we're trying to pull a fast one on you. Um, Wednesday night, uh, the Ministerium of St. Clair will be here, and we're going to have an ecumenical prayer service to pray for peace in Ukraine, and uh, some priest by the name of Blosser is going to be the homeless for that. Uh, if you decide to come, please bring a pillow. Uh, I hear he's a lousy preacher. And then Thursday, Father Bob Finlan, uh, who studied at the St. John Paul II Institute by, he was down, <coughs> excuse me, the best seminary in the world, Mount St. Mary's, uh, also studied at the John Paul II Institute down at uh, 
down in Washington, D.C., so he doesn't know as much about Father K uh, John Paul as Father Kalish does, but Father Finland is going to talk about the Holy Father's involvement in the Solidarity Movement and Perestroika and all of those things that led to the conversion of Russia, of Poland, and breaking away as part of a communist nation. So the need for prayer and things for that. So like I said, uh, we can provide you with all of that if your parishes don't publish anything. Uh, and all the bulletins uh, in many parishes get filled with lots of things, so we understand that, so you're more than welcome. Uh, this is the lady to call. Her name is Mary Ann. Uh, if she gets rude to you on the phone, uh, just tell her your personal friends of mine, and she'll change her out real quick. Um, our format for tonight, similar to what we did last week, um, we'll begin with a, an opening hymn, uh, a call to worship, and Father Ritz will take over for us. Uh, Father Ritz has a PowerPoint presentation uh, where he'll talk about three different aspects of the life of uh, uh, Walter Chiswick and things that uh, are helpful for all of us to pray for his cause of canonization. Uh, if there is, and, and Father can take as much time as he would like with that, um, if there is time and he feels it's worthwhile, um, please note that he will hang around for a couple minutes, but his mom is here tonight, uh, Claire Ritz, and she has to be in bed by 7. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, a little bit uh, about Father Ritz. Uh, Father Ritz was ordained in 2009, so he's been ordained a priest for 13 years. Uh, I am very happy to say that uh, he was one of the seminarians that liked me, and uh, we have become fast friends over the years. We've done a few things together. I recently accompanied him down to my alma mater, Mount St. Mary's, for this presentation, and it was great uh, because I was able to get you know some prayer time in, which was wonderful. Um, Father Ritz has held a number of diocesan assignments. Um, he's been an assistant pastor. Uh, his biggest claim to fame is as a spiritual director to high school kids. Uh, first at uh, Berks, uh, first, first Berks Catholic, and then uh, Allentown Central for a while, right? Notre Dame. Notre Dame, Notre Dame and Bethlehem. So, or, yeah, Notre Dame and Easton. Uh, and then uh, he was called for, for higher things. Um, first, he was sent off to Catholic University uh, to study canon law. And two years ago, he received his license for canon law, to practice canon law. Uh, when he received his degree, he, uh, how do you say this, But don't trouble him on top of him. Uh, he had an assignment book that big. Uh, he was named Chancellor of the Diocese of the position he currently holds. Uh, Chancellor means that he's the official record keeper for the diocese. All official documents are translated by him to come from Rome and elsewhere. He has the official seal of the diocese uh, where uh, it's not an official document unless he signs it or the seal is on it. Um, he also, in the midst of all of this, is in charge of preparing our permanent deacon class. And uh, we are in the process, we're two years away from ordaining his first class. And he's already started to put together another class. Uh, that takes up a, a great deal of his time, too. Um, he serves on the Commission for Minor Ministries and Major Orders, where, uh, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, he and 12 other priests uh, discern how our seminarians are doing and whether or not they should be called to ordination, which is 
I sat in that condition for like 15 years, and uh, it's a lot of heavy stuff. Uh, Father Ritz uh, grew up in Tresco, uh, the son of the late Jack uh, Ritz and his beautiful mother, Lady Claire. Um, three siblings. Um, he went to marry a Catholic, and after marrying a Catholic, he started a vocation where he went down to St. Charles in Philadelphia, where he spent nine years. Um, and while he was after ordination, uh, he was asked to then go for graduate studies uh, down at Catholic U, which I already mentioned. One of his other uh, things that he is responsible for, but yet uh, one of his greatest joys, I know it keeps him sane, especially like me, he's very proud of his coal region roots, is that uh, he is the co-postulator of the cause for the canonization of Father Walter Chiswick. Um, he gives a lot of credit to Monsignor uh, Tony Montone, who was also a co-postulator. Um, uh, but Monsignor Montone died, sadly, before he could get Father Walter on the ranks of saints. So we pray that we can get Father Walter in the rank of saints before you die. <laughs> um, so, but uh, jokingly, you know, here in the coal regions, uh, we jokingly say, could any good come out of Shenandoah? And uh, the answer is yes. A lot of good things come out of Shenandoah. And it's just not necessarily Mrs. T's pierogies. <laughs> it's this wonderful man, um, by the name of Walter Chiswick, who grew up under some very hard times, some very difficult times, um, and a very interesting history. And more than anything else, you know how I take pride in the fact of knowing that uh, Father John, or my, uh, Bishop John Neumann, walked the streets of Pottsville, walked the streets of St. Clair, walked the streets of Hectorsville, knowing that a saint walked in our midst that St. Elizabeth Ann Seton sent her nuns up here to begin the uh, Good Samaritan Hospital long before it was the Good Samaritan Hospital. Saints have drawn here. But to me, it's very moving and a very big cause of my prayer to say that we actually have our own co region saint. And I want to thank Father Ritz um, for all the hard work that he has done, all the study that he has done on. Uh, on Father Walter, and uh, hopefully one day uh, we can have him in the halls of recognized saints uh, for the church. Um, I'd ask you now to stand for our call to worship. Our hymn is number 191 in our cradle book. Hymn number 191, Remain With Me.
job at Chancellor, it sounds a lot more important than it really is, I assure you. Uh, I'm so grateful to him for his friendship, for his guidance. He uh, certainly uh, been a great help, a uh, friend to me uh, through my years of priesthood and in the seminary. And I'm grateful for his hospitality to me. Uh, of course, good things come from Shannon Mills. Very nice here. <laughs> Right now, you know, at least in charge of the earthly remains of Father Walter Chizik in the cemetery of Warnersville. I see that two of our deacon candidates are here. Your own John Madalevich is here with Barry. You should be so very proud of him and his years of formation. And I know we are. And uh, Mark Rosina, his classmate from all the way down in, well, he's from St. Benedict's in Moe, Pennsylvania, which is a real place. It does exist way down there in the It's a beautiful spot. And, uh, so grateful uh, for them. As uh, Monsignor mentioned, uh, my mom is here, Tresco is home. Uh, this is one of the few places in the world I can say Tresco is home, and some of you know where it is. So some of you are McAdoo is my home parish. And uh, so I had to do this just to embarrass her. <laughs> St. Clair. <laughs> Forget Mr. Uh, St. Clair Nichols who once farmed this land. Uh, and if you're not familiar with where Tresco is, that's okay. We're not bigger than uh, Arnett's edition. <laughs> if you'll forgive me, I, I do like to use my notes when I speak to keep me on track so that we're not here forever. Because I always say when I preach or speak without notes, it's probably the longest experience of your life. <laughs> so that being said, uh, it is a great joy to assist in the cause of canonization of Father Walter. Now, there's two phases to a canonization. One that occurs within the diocese, where you actually open a tribunal or a court and investigate the person's life and take testimony, and we have volumes of that in our archive in Allentown. That was long since completed before I was ever a priest. And I was asked on our, our uh, trip to uh, Mount St. Mary's, one of the seminarians said, well, how do you get to be the co-postulator? And I said, well, it's simple. The last one passed away. <laughs> <laughs> and you do need, in the process of canonization, someone who's on the ground, so to speak, in the diocese that's sponsored or considered the sponsor of this cause, and uh, to serve as the liaison between the postulator and uh, the, the uh, Society of Jesus, uh, the Jesuits, in their curia, their, their home office, so to speak, in Rome, has a postulator for all of the Jesuits' causes who are open for canonization, and there are many of them. And um, he, he's a delightful guy. He's from Spain. has spent a good deal of time in, in, uh, in Rome. And in addition to his Spanish and Italian, I am so grateful he speaks English also, <laughs> which makes those conversations very easy. A delightful guy, Father Siliano. So, uh, that being said, uh, once senior Glosser and I, I, I couldn't let him out of this, we did travel to the greatest of seminaries, uh, just a couple of months ago. And there we are uh, on the, the beautiful front porch of Mount St. Mary's with Father Baker, who was here, once senior Baker, who was here last week, uh, the rector of the Mount, of course, a priest of our diocese. So, we had a delightful, wonderful time, and it was on the ride home that, uh, Father Bill, I think, started to put this all together. I could see the wheels were turning, the smoke coming out of his ears. It's all coming together. <laughs> and how important it is, though, because who would have known at that time what we would be seeing going on right now? And so we unite ourselves tonight with, especially the people of Ukraine, people who are suffering. And, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, it was the Ukrainian Catholic Metropolitan that got Father Chizik his false papers to get into Russia. So the Ukrainian church plays a big part in this story. Okay. The three parts of the presentation is, is, uh, is his books, of course, I'll mention. I, I, I always do this presentation about him knowing two things. That a good number of people sitting in front of me have read his books. Uh, of course, with God in Russia, far more of uh, you know, that chronological sketch, and his spiritual masterpiece. And I would argue one of the great spiritual masterpieces, not just of the last century, but of all time. He leadeth me. You know, written 
fun of our A spectacular reflection on God's divine providence. And if you haven't read them, I recommend them to you. But I also realize that whenever I speak about Father Chizik, there's a great number of people in it who will say, oh, that's how you pronounce that name. So if you'll forgive me, for those of you who know the story, we're just going to tell the story, go through it. And I'd like to talk about a couple points. I, I personally see Father Chizik, in my own reflections on him since, since receiving this uh, assignment, I see him as the response to the culture of our day. The secular relativism that pervades our culture. We'll talk just a little bit about that. And finally, I'd like to talk about them in light of what's called the traditio, just the tradition at priestly ordination. I had the chance to reflect on this, and I don't normally do this in talks, but I, I thought, you know what? Not only do we do this for the seminarians at the time, but the coal regions have produced an extraordinary number of vocations. You know, the church in our diocese right now owes a great deal to the coal regions of Northeast Pennsylvania. We say, of course, we don't have enough priests and we pray for vocations, but good Lord, if it wasn't for Schuylkill County, there would, would there be no, just, there are a lot of priests from other areas, but when we get together, the, the great number of us, this is all, and it's always going to be home. So, here we are. The conclusion to Matthew's Gospel, I think, is the starting point. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. There is the command that sets the Gospel on mission for the Church to go into every nation in the world. And I think this is the command that took Walter Chizek, a native of what is now the Diocese of Allentown, faith Grit fortitude took him 5,000 miles from here. Where he, and this is the way I like to put his life, where he endured cruelty, where he courted martyrdom, where he united his life to Jesus Christ to proclaim him crucified. So his story. Born November 4th, 1904, the feast of St. Charles Borromeo, patron of that other seminary. Uh, was a for a couple years there. Uh, he died on um, the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, just a, a month after his 88th birthday, 1984. He's the son of Martin and Mary Chizik. They immigrated from Poland about 10 years before he was born. Came from a very large Polish uh, American family. Two of his sisters were Bernadine Franciscans. Think of it, all those children, right? Three vocations to the life of the church. You know, in Ireland, they joked it was a tie, 10%. One in every 10 went, and that's how Ireland got so many priests. The Chizik stayed free. And we thank God for them. Father Dan Flaherty was the uh, Jesuit priest who edited his books, and I never met him in person. He, he died uh, not that long ago, over a year ago, I think. Maybe longer. Um, but it, it's somewhat recent. And I only got to appreciate his work when I read the notes that went into Father Chizik's books. He never forgot anything, and he wrote it all down. And so to get him in a readable book was quite the effort. That might actually be his first miracle. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he always said that to understand him, he needed to understand Shenandoah. Whenever I give this presentation, I always like to show Shenandoah as it was at a distance as he was growing up. Now, for those of you who know his story, to say he was a tough child is putting it mildly. Constantly having to prove how tough he was, I like to call him a tough guy when I give talks to high school kids about him. And he picked street fights, was uh, well acquainted with detention when he went to school. Uh, once in adolescence, you might know the story, his father forcibly walked into the police station in Shenandoah and begged the police to take him into custody and send him to reform school because he was so belligerent. In today's education system, he would be quickly labeled a bully and sent to the guidance office for help and counseling. He would. When he was in eighth grade, he determined he was going to be a priest. Like so many of the sons of Polish immigrants, he went off to Orchard Lake Seminary, the minor seminary in Pontiac, Michigan. The average winter low there is uh, 16 degrees. Shenandoah prepared him well. 
all right? Being up to Wicker is kind of no. Um, being an athlete, having to prove how tough he was, I love these stories. And he talks about this, especially with God in Russia. He said, uh, I'd like to quote this here, I had to be tough. I had to get up at uh, 4.30 in the morning to run five miles around the lake on the seminary grounds or go swimming in November when the lake was a little better than frozen. I couldn't stand to think that anyone could do something I couldn't do. One year during Lent, I ate nothing but bread and water for 40 days. Another year, year I ate no meat at all, just so I could see if I could do it. I was in the minor seminary, the college seminary in Philadelphia, when I read with God in Russia. I remember sitting in my room in the college dorm, reading this book, thinking to myself, if this man lived down the hall from me, I would think he was crazy. <laughs> so from being a bully, you know, to serious what you would call issues of formation, in the minor seminary, he reads the hagiography, the biography of St. Stannis, lost Oscar, another great Polish saint. And a Jesuit. And a Jesuit. <laughs> <laughs> like you love senior. <laughs> and I think I identified with him, his determination, perhaps his rebellious nature. If you read it, his story is one for another day. It's a great story. He had a very independent mind and spirit. And having never met a Jesuit priest, Walter decides to become one. And so at the end of the academic year in Michigan, he boards the train, and instead of coming home to Schuylkill County, he makes his way up to Poughkeepsie, to St. Andrews on the Hudson, former Jesuit division there. And he would not leave until he saw the provincial and refused not to be accepted. <laughs> Remarkably, if not astoundingly, they let him in. So it's a long process to become a diocesan priest. It's a longer process to become a Jesuit. And, of course, he had to do what was hard. On the uh, Solemnity of the Assumption, on August 15, 1929, Pope Pius XI, in a moment that speaks to the global witness of the Church, you know, in Catholicism and the compassion of the Church, I hope we pray that we, we are seen to be manifested uh, even today. Our Holy Father then founded what's called the Russican College. Well, that's their St. Andrews on the Hudson, there, sorry. And there's uh, the Russell College in uh, Mo Pius. Because the situation was bleak, something that seems to be repeating itself. It was 12 years after the revolution in Russia, and a land that was once so steeped in Christianity was suffering under the godless doctrine of communism, robbing the good people there of their religion and its practice. And I love the line, and uh, I'm glad Father Fuller's here because this is the great. The, Best tribute I could have. You know, a generation later, Stalin would quit. How many divisions does the Pope have? And I thought, who needs a division? He sent in the Jesuits. That's our division. In reality, communist Russia was obsessed with the Holy See, and after all, um, the novice Walter Chizek volunteered for service. It would be more difficult. He would have to teach. And in 1937, he was ordained a priest. Sorry, I got the picture. He was ordained a priest and found himself in Alders of Bolton. In 1941, he was ministering there when the Nazis arrived. They invaded and destroyed the Jesuit church in that town. He writes about, if you read, he writes about what it was to find his church in a state of desecration. The church was largely destroyed, and he could have returned to another mission. He could have gotten out, he could have done, but now he was more determined than ever. But he needed to be patient, so he took a job in logging. There he is, the logger. But after the Germans were in Poland, then so were the Russians. And it presented him the opportunity to vanish into a stream of refugees. How poignant is that today? In the images we see on the nightly news, Walter Chizik put himself there. He put himself on a train going into Russia. You know, I almost think of that moment on September 11th when we watched the videos of the firefighters running into the towers. You know, while everyone else was running out, 
Walter Chizik is running in, into Russia under the name Vladimir Lipinski, a widower who had never existed before that day. He manages to make it about a year uh, outside of Moscow when the NKVD predecessor to the KGB arrests him, accuses him of being a spy, and they sent him to that famous prison a few blocks from Red Square, Lubyanka. Now, it doesn't look on the outside like a terrible place, does it? It would almost remind you of like an old hotel, which I believe at one point it might have been until it was converted. You look at this building and think, it doesn't look too bad. There's the inside. Five years here, torture, starvation, isolation. Sometimes he shared a cell with Nazis and murderers, but for the most part he was kept in the desolation of solitary confinement. The ironic part of it is the only Catholic church offering mass in Moscow was across the street. Diplomats only. Not to be too graphic, but they would put his head in a vice. They would beat him, pose, and rope. And they would drug him with heroin. I knew, I, I got the chance to meet a priest, I'll just say a priest of very venerable age, uh, who went to Father Walter on a number of occasions. And they offered mass together one day. And in the sacristy, they were close enough that he showed, Father Walter showed him his back. He just took his shirt down a little after mass. And, he asked him if he could touch. He said the wounds on his back were almost undescribable. You know, the, the, the scars that were left there. And he touched them in silence and he prayed. And this, this priest who is in his early 90s talking to me is beginning to cry. And he said it was the most profound meditation on the passion and scourging of Christ he had ever had was to touch Walter Jesus' back. Sometimes you don't always think of it that way. After one brutal interrogation, and it took them almost a year. As he said, I was doped up on heroin. He broke it. And I think it's the pivotal moment in his life for many reasons. But he finally broke it. The tough guy. This is what it took. Which one of us has not come to a circumstance or situation in our life where we finally feel like we broke? We've all been there spiritually. I think it's, it's part of our journey. This is what it took for Walter Chizik to break. They had to beat him and drug him under the most extraordinary circumstances, sentenced to 10 years of hard labor in Siberia, but they didn't let him leave for another four years to begin serving his sentence. I think they thought they were going to get more out of him or something. There was nothing to get out of him. And so he, he set up the day based on the pattern of his novition, morning prayers, evening prayers. He recited the prayers of the Mass without the elements of bread and wine. He said the rosary in several languages. He would clean his room. He set up a pattern of daily life. Eventually, when he was released, he boarded the train to Siberia for his ten-year punishment, went again into an overstuffed box car. Three weeks and 2,500 miles north. When in Siberia, the train line came to an end, they got on a boat and took him for 20 more days north to the town of Norlis, which is an archipelago 10 degrees north of the Arctic Circle. For labor, almost ironically, like his father in a coal mine, then an ore processing plant, and then back into the mine. This, if you can see the arrow points to more of this. Okay. There's a picture from more Average winter low, negative 64. He writes about it. Everything was frozen. I refer to this as frozen purgatory. I can't imagine what this is. But there he meets another priest. And I, I, I love the story of the friendship he developed. And he manages to receive the most blessed sacrament, go to confession, and meet another priest for the first time in five years. The prisoners there would take their raisins out of their gruel. They would ferment them and make enough wine that mass could be celebrated. Uh, they would use little tiny pieces of bread. He talks about how his elements for mass were a shot glass at the back of a men's watch as a patent. And I love this quote. Please remember this picture. If you would. It was my primary concern each new day I would go to any length, suffer any inconvenience, run any risk to make the bread of life available to these 
his men. Ever, ever decreased, ever devoted to Max. You know, I, I think of this. He, he used to fast daily in case he had the chance to celebrate Max. I can tell you on Monday morning, I'm going to roll over and groan when I have to go, say, the 6.30 garage morning mass before I go off to a busy day. All I have to do is walk into the sacristy. You know, I, I think of Walter Chizik at those moments just in case he could say mass. And you think of the amount of calories he was expending in hard mining every day. How exhausting that had to be. So he worked under the most miserable of conditions. Uh, and to say that it was terrible, it was inhumane, it was ruthless, it was cruel. Details found in the books. He finished, and this is another point remarkable to me, he finishes his 10 year sentence early. They have a quote, you have to mind this much. If you don't, you're going to stay after and mind it. But if you finish and work hard, we'll let you out if he finishes a few months early. How remarkable is that? Talk about like, obedience to God's prophet, what he believes to be God's providential plan for him. God leading him through it. He was finally released, closely watched. He stayed in the Orlis with that priest for another two years. Uh, they lived in what I would describe as a shack. You know, two small beds, a little stove, and an altar between them to say Mass on, which they would do faithfully every morning. But this was when he was permitted to write to his sisters. No one, uh, it, it, I, I fear that we're almost seeing an iron curtain descending again, aren't we? No one on this side of the Iron Curtain had known he was alive since the late 1930s. They weren't even sure it was actually him. Until in his letters, he started to refer to things that only he would know as a child. That he would only know growing up in the household. Once he made references to them, they realized this isn't some Russian putting this on. While he was there, he offered masses, he gave retreats. Baptized. I, yeah, I remember the, the one, um, the secret confessions, but the one question I loved, he was asked, how many uh, did you baptize? And he said, we stopped counting after three years when we reached 800. What happened to him spiritually, though, after he raised it, was his self sufficiency is stripped away. And God leads him to an understanding of his problem. Father Chizek realized that while what we do for God is important, more important than what he gives us in return. And there's a spiritual richness that he extrapolates in his writings from this time. And it is, as I said at the beginning, one of the most brilliant exposés on our call to abandon ourselves to the providence that God has for us. So in 1958, they ordered him out of the Orlis and Siberia. He stays in several locations, settles in the town of Avakan, where he lives under the name, I love the names, of Vladimir Martinovich which is what he was known as for several years as he worked as an auto mechanic, having to be so closely watched by the NKVD, having to keep his priesthood largely in secrecy, though he celebrates Mass and prays every day in the privacy of his room. And those were his last three years in Russia. Again, the orders were told not where. He tells the story uh, in his notes from Avakan about the bus picking him up and his leaving his friend the emotion of all of that. They take him to a hotel in Moscow, and they're trying to convince him of the so-called fruits of communism. See, look what we have here. Isn't this amazing? And he's trying to figure out what on earth is this all about? Until, um, until Mr. Kirk from the State Department under uh, the late President John Kennedy's administration exchanged him for two Russian spies. And I, I love the story that he tells of his departure. They meet at the airport, and it's the first time someone addresses him as Father Chizek in English in decades. Star Wars. Father, I'm here to take you home. He gets on a plane, and hours later, he's at what is now JFK, I don't know, where he's greeted by his sisters. One uh, of his sisters uh, from the Virgin Order went with it was there to greet him as his other sister, who I've met. I'm sorry, not met her, I met her father. Her daughter was married that day. They left the wedding reception to go to the airport. And for many of them, it was the first time they met their uncle Walter. I was asked um, in an interview, uh, Catholic News Association uh, did something on Father during the pandemic. And they said, what was his return to the US like? And I said, the picture speaks a thousand words. This is his picture as an inmate. This is his picture upon his return home. Look at the expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
This is my favorite picture of Father Walter Chiswick. Joy, look at his sister. He startled. This is from Time Magazine. We did the next verse I have, so that's the picture here. He described it as almost being like a fairy tale. I love the scene where the plane takes off and he says he sees the Kremlin. He sees it in the distance of the plane. He looks at Russia one last time and he makes the sign of the cross out the window over Russia and its people. And I can't help but keep that image of him in my mind now. Pray God he's interceding from the kingdom of God for the same right here and right now. He comes home, he works at the John Twenty-Third Center at uh, Fordham, now known as the uh, Center for uh, Eastern uh, Christian Studies, located at the University of Scranton, another fine Jesuit institution. Uh, oh, okay. 1980 and I made it. 1980. Yep. So it was a good year. I was there for those calls. 82 was a better year. <laughs> <laughs> Father Lossi, we're in his presence. He gave spiritual direction, he gave some amazing talks to the priests and people that have met him. They tell me one after another the impact that he had on their lives. Um, I, I'll spare details on the process of canonization um, in favor of more spiritual reflection. Those are the two points. But if anybody wants to know something about it as best as I can, I'll answer. Because if we just look at his story, it's scratching the surface. It's nowhere near enough. You know, you see a man of mental, mystical prayer, I would, I would call it. A man who made such great sacrifices just to carry out his priesthood to offer Mass. And then, from the richness and power of the Mass, as he understood it, offered the, from the fullness of God's grace that gift to countless thousands of others. So, my next little love, I'll leave this up for a while. I love this picture. Um, you know, we all know the threat of spreading communism. I, I always say, you know, a generation ago, maybe you remember getting under your desk and holding your head down as if that would somehow help. I'm still not exactly sure what anyone thought that would do, but I saw a picture the other day online and it showed a little student's desk and it said bomb shelter circuit 1970, you know. And uh, really though, now we live under um, really the threat of a relativistic culture. It's a culture that, it, it's a doctrine that says you, you can't really know the truth. Everything and all of morality is reduced to opinion and what I think about something. It's almost as if somehow the human soul is blinded from finding an absolute good. And I think Father Walter's life goes beyond showing us a diagnosis of how we respond to a culture that isn't healthy. He, his, his life provides the cure. What he did. A quote out of Pope Benedict. You know, the Pope Emeritus, he says, What cares is a friendship with Christ that opens us up to all that is good, that gives us the criteria by which to distinguish what's false from what's true. And so I place before you for your consideration that the virtues of this man, his friendship with Christ, put him on mission to bring about the salvation of countless thousands of souls. And you know, for ourselves, it's not like, you know, we don't necessarily even need to be in the Ukraine or, or Russia or places like North Korea or Syria or places that suffer in global trauma every day. I believe his life tells us we could be missionaries of the gospel here and now in the places that God gives us to the people that need the experience of the person of Jesus Christ in a culture that so desperately needs him. So, when I was asked to share about St. Mary's Seminary, this is just the final part of, of this. Uh, it's a reflection on the priesthood. And what the priesthood is, I, I pray that you know, intended to be and who the priest is asked to be. And since being asked to assist with Father Walter to his cause, he has more and more become for me a model of the vocation to the priesthood. And I find, especially as Lent meets its conclusion in the dawn of Holy Thursday and the institution of the Eucharist, and, and therefore the priesthood, this is perhaps one of the best reflections we could have in Lent. You know, when a man is ordained a priest, he stands up and they dress him in priestly vestments, and it's quite the moment. And the new priest immediately kneels before his bishop. Um, and this is this is a picture of this moment. And there's Bishop Gaynor, a Pottsville native, speaking of some of the bull regions going on. There's the Bishop of Harrisburg. 
just a few years ago. This is the moment I'm talking about. They call it the tradition. Because the tradition is that the priest is handed a chalice of unconsecrated wine and a pat of unconsecrated bread. And it's placed in his hand. The bishop places it in his hands moments after he's ordained. And at this point, I know I was shaking. And I think if a man isn't shaking at that point, he probably ought to be. Um, he received, and this is what his bishop says to him, because this is my reflection on Walter Schiff. Understand what you do, imitate what you celebrate, and conform your life to the mystery of the Lord's cross. There's Walter Schiff. Understand what you do, the subject of years of formation, academic lectures and study, most of all prayer. Um, you know in his life, it was his years in the Jesuit novitia that allowed him to structure his life in such a way that he brought about the pattern of his daily life. Understanding what you do, my goodness was he well trained. And he, he, he was known to say that what he learned in formation is, is what got, got him through it. it we can never necessarily discount the things that we learn, what God is preparing us for. Isn't that true of our lives? We don't always understand something, or why it's unfolding, or a situation or circumstance that we're dealing with. We don't always know why, but we know that somehow in God's not that he causes suffering, but that he's allowing for it for a purpose. Father Walter understood that. Imitate what you celebrate. The chalice and pat and bread and wine that we would call the tools of a priest's trade or what the instruments for his use. Um, in the mind of Siberia, those tools, like I said, were a shot glass with raisin wine in the back of a man's watch for a patent and some stolen bread. Now, I once heard a priest give a reflection on the, on, on the priesthood that drew significance from bread and wine, unconsecrated. He said, remember, we have to be cultivated, grown, harvested, sifted, milled, prepared, and baked at a high level of heat for a finished product. Grapes take years to cultivate and mature, and then in their prime they have to be picked, squashed, and fermented at very precise times and in remarkably specific ways to produce something that's worthy of drinking. Bread and wine in the hands of a priest, unconsecrated, think of the work that's already accomplished. Think of that day in Rome in 1937 when Father Chiswick was ordained in service to the Eastern Church. The priest is told to imitate what he celebrates and like the wheat and grace the priest is called to surrender his life as a sacrifice for something much greater. So to every Christian. I love the story of uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, the other St. Ignatius, with due respect to Ignatius of Loyola, this is Ignatius of Antioch. As he's being carried in chains to Rome, we have uh, a letter written from him. There are seven letters, I believe, we have from Ignatius of Antioch. And one of them is to the Christians ahead at Rome as he's going there to be martyred. And he's cautioning them not to try and stop his earthly demise. He writes this. I am God's meat, and I shall be ground by the teeth of beasts, that I may become the more pure bread of Christ. The pure bread. The millstones. Father Walter had his millstone. His was a greater, more crushing millstone than many of us could ever imagine. Imagine what he faced. His loneliness. The pain he suffered from torture, the deep suffering. It grinded him into a very pure wheat, and then through deep prayer, he saw how God was leading him through it. I propose that every Christian, every priest, certainly needs his millstone. Every Christian in their own vocation needs a millstone. Perhaps this is a good time to contemplate your Lent. What's my millstone? What particular suffering has God not caused to allow in his providential care for us? What is turning us into the more pure bread of Christ offered up in sacrifice? Father Chizek teaches us to see that in his God's providence. So the final command uh, of the bishop, conform your life to the mystery of the Lord's cross, the same one friends consecrated bread and wine, is immediately placed on the altar for Mass, and the priest puts them to use. Now my favorite Eucharistic gift is the Adorote Devote by Thomas Aquinas. It's the first line. La Tante Tots. I adore you devout the hidden God. Hidden God. The Eucharist remains veiled. God is present, not in some glorious return, but in the most humble way possible, still veiled to our eyes. I found the 
picture of a, what an ancient millstone looks like. Icon celebrated this mass from the heart of John Vian. He sat at the foot of this very altar, speaking of the great priest. Much of the work of the priest, and indeed every Christian, is meant to remain hidden. So I have presented what we know about Father Chizik, something, his heroic virtue. But I always have to wonder how much, how much was really left on the set? What remained in this priest's heart? And I think he tells us that the entire church must be content to work solely for God's honor. Because all of our prayers, works, and sufferings are in so many ways veiled from the world. We never really know what's going on in the life of another person. So just to conclude, I'll just ask you to please remember a man who once risked his life for the sake of the sacramental absolution of sins, for the grace of the sacraments, and most of all for the sanctification that occurs in the depths of our being from Holy Mass. But I also ask you to remember his warning. Remember said, remember that picture, the image of the barbed wire? This is his warning, and he leaded me. And it was his warning for priests, but I like to share it with everyone, and also share with everyone the encouragement that he gave to those priests. He wrote that the evil they felt was as tangible as the barbed wire fence that surrounded them, and it was doing battle for their minds. He wrote that the priests had to convince themselves to renew their faith in Christ's victory. Isn't that point for our coming Easter? From Siberia, Father Walter talks about how the missionary plan of the Gospels brought about. He said, it goes about by God's grace, by his providence, not in some visionary crusade. I love that one. He said, Christianity does not spread by some visionary crusade, but by the grace of God. God presenting us opportunities, people. And it comes about by his providence. And he'll accept nothing less than our acting on those opportunities to bring Christ to others. So from his frozen purgatory, he recalls that every moment we have is a, a gift precious from God. And then he says the words that our, our wounded church needs to hear so often. Oh, sorry, that's not that. These are the words. Waste no time through doubt or discouragement because Christ alone guarantees success. Waste no time on doubt or discouragement because Christ alone guarantees success. So Father Walter's life begs us to trust in the providence of God that he will give us the grace that is sufficient for what is before us, that God will not fail us. He will give us the fortitude, the courage necessary in every circumstance. He gives us a firmness in difficulties. He gives us a constancy in the pursuit of what is good. He gives us the resolve to resist temptation and to conquer our fears and most of all, to face life's most tremendous trials. And that is what I have learned in being the co-postulator for the life of Father Walter Chiswick. And I thank you for the invitation and most of all, the privilege of your time. God bless you all. Thank you. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not deem equality with God, a thing that he grasped. But rather, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted. Everything that preceded this moment, all the events and actions of the preceding years, ultimately led to this crisis. Standing on the brink of total darkness, I desperately turned to God in prayer. This conversion moment created a fundamental change in my mind, but redirected everything to God. From this source flowed all the inspiration, motivation, and the strength to act. 
I've been trying to use my own will and mind to do something that was beyond my capabilities and basically all wrong. God's will was not hidden out there in mysteries I could not understand. The real and immediate situations of each day were God's will for me. Every moment of life, with all its good and bad, reflects God himself. I recognized him in the concrete and common things around me, revealing his will for me to follow. This new relationship with God fascinated, fulfilled me. Faith made it real and true as nothing else ever had before. I found God's presence in creation, ever communicating and responding to faith's quest, the center of life and existence, encompassing past, present, and future. The realization of God's immensity filled my heart with a sense of inner dignity. The mystery remained impenetrable, yet it affected my soul deeply and made me conscious of God's indwelling. Gradually, my mind began to participate in this experience too, in its limited way. I even felt a physical sense of belonging to God. The souls of the just are in the hands of God, and no torment shall touch them. The prayer to surrender, written by Father Walter Chiswick. Lord Jesus Christ, I ask the grace to accept the sadness of my heart as you will for me in this moment. I offer it up in union with your sufferings for those who are in deepest need of your redeeming grace. I surrender myself to your Father's will, and I ask you to help me to move on to the next task that you have set for me. Spirit of Christ, help me to enter into a deeper union with you. Lead me away from dwelling on the hurt I feel, to thoughts of charity for those who need my love, to thoughts of compassion for those who need my care, and to thoughts of giving to those who need as I give myself to you, help me to provide for the salvation of those who come to me in need. May I find my healing in this giving. May I always accept God's will. May I find my true self by living for others in the spirit of sacrifice and suffering. May I die more fully to myself and live more fully in Father Walter, be 
and we lose spiritual houses, we lose churches, and we cry, we stand on our feet and say, why do I need church? You know, we don't use them for what they're meant for. They're bound to close. So let's pray for our faith and let's restore it. But once again, thank you for coming. And I hope to see many of you back again on the 21st of March or somewhere during that week. As I said, please give us a call if uh, these schedules don't make it into your bulletin. We'll probably put something in the newspaper also. Miss Mary Lou, what do you say I was home with? Our hymn is number 600. It's just a simple little take, Lord, and receive. Hymn number 600. I'll play it through first. Uh, before you play that, this is called the Sushi Peg, which is, once again, a prayer of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Jesuit. Oh, God. <laughs>